along in your Bible or on the screens. We have the text on the screens for you. Malachi, closing out what we looked at this last week. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. We looked at that last week. All right. And so then you turn the page from Malachi into the New Testament. And here's what you're going to hear in Luke chapter 1, verse 5 to 17. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Now while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled. And you can understand that, can you not? 400 years. Zechariah was troubled when he saw him. And fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Imagine that. This priest knows the Old Testament. And he's just had an angel show up and quote Malachi to him. They've longed generation. How many generations for 400 years? If a generation is 40 years, 10 generations have longed, wondered, where is God? Why does he not send us prophets? Have we, has God abandoned us? And here's this man carrying out his priestly duty. And he hears from the Lord for the first time in 400 years. Well, may the Lord help us. As we read this inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word, may he help us to see into that time period tonight. And it's going to take us more than one time. I tried my best to condense it, and I just I can't do it justice for that. But to prepare us to begin to see Jesus in the New Testament. He's easy to see there. He's all through it. But I hope this, this brief detour, if you want to call it that, will help us to see the context in which he came, the culture to which he came more clearly, and it will help us to see his mission more meaningfully. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we come to you in Jesus' name, grateful that you have brought us thus far through the Old Testament. And we, we confess, we marvel at how you've let us see a measure of what the, what the Puritans meant when they said that the New, the New Testament, is in the Old concealed that we have seen over and over and over again in book after book, in passage after passage, glimpses of the Messiah. 
And now as we anticipate to gaze into the life and ministry of Jesus as recorded in the Gospels, uh, as reflected upon in the, in the Acts and the letters of the Apostles, help us to take this time now and, and understand the history of the Jews and how not only that in your sovereign providence you spoke through the prophets, holy men who were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Not only did you in your sovereign providence send Jesus Christ in the fullness of time, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those of us under the curse of the law, but in your sovereign providence you kept silent and unfolded all of the things that needed to happen to prepare the people for the coming of their Messiah. So teach us by your spirit tonight. Help us to uh, be willing to be good students of history, to learn like the sons of Issachar, to be able to discern the times in which we live, to know how we ought to live in the light of what you have to teach us from this intertestamental period. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Any of you had a study of the, of the 400 years between the Testaments before? Well, this is a first for all of us, then, isn't it? <laughs> you studying it, me studying it with you. So let's look at this together. When the Old Testament closes, we're seeing a partial restoration there. The people are coming out of uh, Babylonian captivity. Uh, that began the captivity. The first wave was 605. Remember, we're going to do a little, little rehearsal here of things we've gone through, but I want to maintain a context for us. Uh, the second wave was 586, the, the big one. In 538, they began to be allowed to return, small groups. We looked at the prophets, seven different prophets ministered during this time period, Daniel, Ezekiel ministered in Babylon, remember, to the exiles, Haggai, Zechariah, Ezra, and Nehemiah, Malachi ministered to the people who were returning to the land. There were a lot of significant changes that happened once Malachi, the prophecy of Malachi was closed in the 400 intervening years. The people as a, as, a, as a population had greatly multiplied. We're going to see in part of this study some of the comments of historians about, about how the Jews were just growing in great numbers uh, wherever they went. By the way, when you talk about the, uh, the exile, there's a word. It's the word dispersion. Now, you may in some of your reading read about the Jews of the diaspora, D-I-A-S-P-O-R-A. -A. That's just a... That's the, another different language for the word dispersion. Those who were dispersed in uh, going and taking captive into exile there. Uh, Syrian exile, 722, the Babylonian exile, 586. And so they're dispersed all over the known world. And they begin to come back partially. And when you get to the New Testament, you, you find they're not under Persian rule. We're going to look at the succession of the kingdoms. But they're under Roman rule. They're under an Edomite king, Herod. <laughs> and you think about all we, we've learned in the Old Testament about God's judgment upon Edom. Believe me, when, when, when a vassal king is set up over the Jews, who's an Edomite, that is, that is God's judgment upon his people. There are religious and political and cultural and civil changes that have taken place. Malachi closes exhorting them to remember the law of Moses, remember the prophets, right? The promise that he would send Elijah. We looked at that. Elijah came in the person of John the Baptist. We've just read about uh, the promise to Zechariah that he would give birth, his wife would give birth to a son. That was going to be John the Baptist who would prepare the way, the messenger. Someone said this as I was reading. Said he was silent, but his silence must have been deafening to the Jewish people. And they responded differently if you, if you study that time in history. Some, some demanded that he act. In other words, God, almost like in a Job fashion. God is going to do, I demand that God do something. 
Some said we're too sinful. We've sinned away the day of his pleasure. And that he will be silent as long as we lack faith. But what you see, and we, and we see this, should see it clearly, is that, that his 400 years of silence was a part of this, of this plan that he had. To heighten a sense of expectation. To remind that you do not take for granted the nearness of the presence and pleasure of God. And you're reminded that what would make sense to us doesn't make sense to God necessarily. So Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, that my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. God does all things in an orderly way. And we've, we've seen this movement throughout the Old Testament that he... Uh, he blesses, the people take for granted his blessings. And so he withdraws and provokes in them uh, a desire for his deliverance. And while it can be demonstrated that, that 400 years of silence had certainly given, uh, caused a complacency to come over some people, there were cr small pockets of people who were in earnest in agony they'd heard the stories from their fathers told by their grandfathers by the, no, they'd heard the stories of God's mighty movements and they longed for God to come and so at this point they've exhausted resources And we need, to, we need to just remember in the, in the scheme of, of Jewish history that during this time, this 400 years, Jews and Samaritans who had kind of dwelt together with an uneasy relationship, that they became religiously and ethnic, ethnically separated during this time. And we see this in the gospel narratives, the woman at the well. Also Aramaic, a, a, a different kind of language from Hebrew, began to replace Hebrew as the common tongue. That'll be instructive because when Jesus comes to teach, he will occasionally speak in Aramaic in the Gospels. Alexander the Great will come on the scene. He will, he will introduce throughout the world what's called a, a Hellenism, Hellenistic influence of the Greeks. Greek, Koine Greek, which uh, you may not know this, but for the longest scholars years ago were trying to figure out what is, this, what is this language, this Greek in the New Testament, because it did not match up with classical Greek. And they kept digging and digging and found out that it was Koine Greek. It was the, it was the, the language of the common person in Greek that God used to introduce the New Testament to people because it was, it was a language spoken around the world of that time, thanks to the conquering of the Greeks. It would be like today. If God were going to write revelatory scripture today, he would no doubt write it in English because English is a universal language around the world. And because of these things, Judaism became increasingly threatened as a distinctive culture with their distinctive Hebrew language. And there's a resistance from the Jews to this. And this is, why, this is what's going to explain when we get into this the, the presence of the, uh, some of the many writings, the intertestamental writings that take place as they're trying to maintain their identity. And so Judaism comes to be developed, <clears throat> excuse me, along these lines. It's called the, uh, the, the three pillars of Judaism, if you want to put that slide up. The three pillars of Judaism. 
the law, which is the, the Torah, uh, the prophets, the Navim, and uh, the writings. And we've, we've given you a term that you, that you would find in some of your studies called the Tanakh, T-A-N-A-C-H. It takes up the Torah, the Navim, and this, the other word for the writings. And so these, this makes up the revelation of God to the Jews, what we call the Old Testament. But there was also the synagogue, one of the things that's going to happen in the intertestamental period because they have been abandoned in, uh, in exile. They've been taken from the temple. They begin to develop these, these synagogues. And the synagogue, the presence of the synagogue introduces a very different approach to the worship of God. The temple was filled with, with sacrifice, emphasizing sacrifice. The synagogue emphasizes obedience to the law. The temple takes up ritual. The synagogues pressed expression, personal piety. And you'll find that this becomes a great preparation for the invasion of Jesus in the first century when he comes to call for radical transformation of life. Also, a third influence was rabbinism, or the rabbi culture, the teacher culture. And they developed the Talmud and the Midrash. These are two significant documents that are developed during the intertestamental period. The priesthood we saw in, in Malachi and other, other prophecies we studied, the priesthood had become corrupt. But by the time that, this, that the Syrian uh, leader Antiochus Epiphanes, or Antiochus IV, comes to the throne in 175 BC, the priesthood is just beyond corrupt. And he, he mocks them in an in a, in a, uh, abomination of desolation in the temple. And it results in what's called the Maccabean Revolt. We're going to look a little more at that. Mattathias was a pious man, priest. And his, he leads a revolt, and his sons, Judas Maccabeus, Jonathan, Simon the Maccabees, they lead a revolt, and that goes on from 168 to 135 B.C. I'm just giving you some introduction here until we plow into this. And they experience for a season in, in the midst of all these different uh, cultures that, that oversee them some freedom, Jewish freedom. And if you're familiar with the Apocrypha, you recognize the name of the book 1st Maccabees and 2nd Maccabees. There's a change in how the priesthood uh, is succeeded. So we need to move a little, move a little faster here. The Pharisees begin to be developed, the Pharisees and the Sadducees in this time period. I told you this morning, if you, there, there are people, there, there are groups we run into in the New Testament that we, we've heard nothing about throughout the Old Testament. You hear nothing about the Pharisees. They're the, uh, they represent the common people. The Sadducees represent the, the, the temple. In fact, I was reading one article that said the Pharisees represented the synagogue movement the, the Sadducees represented the, the uh, temple movement, and they only embraced the Torah. They only embraced the law of the Old Testament. They didn't recognize anything outside the law as valid. They rejected uh, a lot of doctrine that had been developed. The psalmist says, I will dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Sadducees rejected that. The idea of resurrection. 
because it wasn't in the Torah, wasn't in the law. And they're at great odds. They're looked upon as the aristocrats of the Jewish religion. The Pharisees looked upon as the commoners. And they have a lot of tension between one another. You're going to see in the New Testament, there's only one thing that brings them together. And that's their mutual desire to destroy Jesus of Nazareth. And that's the only time you can find historically that the Sadducees and the Pharisees ever joined together to do something. They were, they were sworn enemies other than that. Josephus, a Jewish historian, writes about a lot of these things. When Herod the Great comes along, he is a, he's a vassal king to Rome. He's an Edomian, which means he descends from, from the Edomites, something that would have been abominable for a king, a Jewish king, to have his background. And he dies uh, in 4 BC, about the time that, that Jesus was born. So, let's just, let's move, I, I knew my challenge was going to be not to get bogged down in this, and I don't want to do that. So what I want us to do is, is look at uh, some, some citations from uh, Jewish uh, and other historians, uh, Roman historians. Cicero was a Roman historian. He says, Judaism was, quote, a barbarous superstition, and its followers were a mob. Juvenal, another historian, writes that their Sabbath rest demonstrates their laziness. And so they were not highly regarded, whether in the Persian Empire, who gave them a little more latitude than they had been given, the Egyptian, or the Roman. So let's look at these, these different empires that, that the Jews were under the rule of during the intertestamental period so we can kind of see where the influences come from. Let me give you the four eras, E-R-A. The first is the Persian era, 397 to 336 B.C. And all, of course, you can imagine these, these are succeeded by another as the next, uh, per, next group conquers the previous. Then the Greek era, 336 B.C. to 323 B.C. Then the Egyptian era, 323 to 198 B.C. Then the Syrian era, 198 to 165 B.C. Then the Maccabean era. The Maccabean era, this is Jews who were able to stave off the enemies and, and experience a season of independence, though it will come to an end with the Roman era. And so by the time we get into the New Testament, there are Roman uh, garrisons all throughout Palestine. They're under Roman domination. So let's look at these one by one tonight, just to get kind of begin to give you a sense of the chronology here. The Persian era, uh, actually go back further than this, but for our purposes for studying these 400 years, it actually began in 536, remember, when they conquered the Babylonians, and then they allowed the, uh, the Jews to begin to return to their homeland and build the wall and rebuild the temple. So what did these Persians contribute to the Jews? It was a, it was a sense of, of foreign policy. A sense of an identity as a people and how you relate to the rest of the world. Because you'll remember when we were studying the Old Testament that after the death of Solomon, the Jewish people split into the northern and, and southern kingdom. They are, they are hostile to one another, so they do not present a united front to any foreign entity. And ultimately, both of these are removed from the land by the Assyrian captivity in 722 and the Babylonian captivity in 586. So the northern kingdom is scattered all over the Assyrian Empire. 
And people from the southern kingdom were scattered all over the Babylonian empire. Multitudes removed from their homeland in Israel and Judah. Just a second. The Persians, as they warmed up to the people when they had conquered Babylon, they let them return to their land. And they let them govern themselves as long as that governing did not result in them trying to cast off the yoke of the Persians. So when the Old Testament ends around 400, 425 B.C., Judea continued to be a Persian territory under the governor of Syria. And the high priest, something different, not only was a, was a religious leader, but he took on some civil authority. He was almost like a, like a king priest in the Jews by Persian uh, permission. The Jews were allowed to uh, observe their religious uh, practices without Persia's outside interference. And it was, it was a, an internal rivalry over, the, over who was going to be high priest that resulted in the partial destruction of Jerusalem by the Persian governor. So it was an uprising that the Persians put down. And so the Persian era gives way to the Greek era in 336 to 323 B.C. Alexander the Great, you'll remember, uh, in 331 defeated uh, king Darius, the Persian king, Darius the third. And it gave him con control of the Persian Empire. Alexander the Great as a conqueror extended more influence over the known world than any other uh, conqueror. He conquered Persia, Babylon, Palestine, Syria, Egypt, I don't know if you knew this or not, as well as Western India. His empire was extensive. Now, his life was short though. He only reigned over Greece for 13 years. He died at the age of 33. But his influence lived long after him. His desire was to, to establish a worldwide empire unified by language, custom, and civilization. So under his influence, the entire uh, Western world began to speak and study the Greek language. And you call this process, in case you're wondering, it's called Hellenization. Uh, for example, if you're familiar in, uh, from college, what were the Hellenic clubs? Well, they're sororities and fraternities. And what are their, what are their letters? Their Greek letters, Alpha Chi Omega. It comes directly from this, from this Greek influence over the Western world. Hellenization was the adoption of Greek culture and religion in parts of the world. In fact, it was, this is something to study historically. It was so popular, so pervasive, that even when the Romans come into power, which we will see in our, in our little chronology here, the Romans bring the Latin language. Who speaks Latin today? Nobody. It's called a dead language. When I studied it in high school, you could study French or German or Latin. And I... I can't give you any meaningful explanation as to why I studied Latin rather than French or German. I think Spanish, maybe even Spanish, I think so there were those options. But it didn't survive. Even though the Romans came into domination and the Roman Empire, as expansive as it was, 
They dealt with Greek-speaking people. Latin never supplanted Greek. But Alexander, even as great a conqueror as he was, he still permitted the Jews to observe their laws. And he granted the Jews an exemption from taxes during their sabbatical years. Very interesting. And when they would celebrate a seventh year in their sabbatic cycle, he recognized that and honored that by exempting them from taxes. He wanted to unite the world through Greek thinking and speaking. And it was the Greek culture that was pervasive that God used to communicate what you and I call the New Testament. But they, were a, they were a polygamous uh, people. They, uh, they worshiped many gods, polytheists, I mean, worshiped many gods. And that, of course, would come into direct clash with the, with the Jewish worship of the one God. And it's this Koine Greek that God used to communicate throughout the known world the good news of the gospel. Now the Orthodox Jews resisted this influence of, of, of the Greeks because of the pagan polytheism. And you can imagine an Orthodox Jew, a worshiper of the one true Jehovah, would not embrace all of this culture and all this language because to them it led to the rejection of God. And it was during this period that the Greek language was so pervasive that the Old Testament, the Hebrew Old Testament, was translated into Greek. You've heard us talk several times throughout the study of the Old Testament about the Septuagint. The Septuagint. The Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Old Testament. And I told you at the time that it had several values. Obviously, the value in that day was that everybody under Greek culture could read the Old Testament. They could read about the movements of God. They would, have, they would have never touched it had it stayed in Hebrew. But another one of the values for those of us in our day and time in studying is in order to translate a Hebrew manuscript into Greek, you had to make some one-to-one -one equivalencies that this Hebrew word would mean would be this word in the Greek. And that then became the bridge to let us know how the Old Testament and the New Testament in Greek Communicate with one another. Those ideas that are the same. And so it proved to be a very, a very valuable. But then this is replaced in 323 B.C. by the Egyptian era. Alexander the Great died in 323. His, his empire was divided um, into four segments under four of his generals. Ptolemy, Lysimachus, Cassander, and Salinas. Ptolemy, spared, spelled P-T-O-L-E-M-Y, was named Ptolemy Soter. Now, you, you won't recognize that. Soter is the Greek word for Savior. He set himself up as the people's Savior. He was the first of, a, of the Ptolemy dynasty, which was very, uh, very influential. He dealt severely with the Jews, a very different approach than Alexander had taken. And then as, his, as he was succeeded, and one, a fellow called Ptolemy Philadelphus uh, had a different attitude toward the Jews. The Septuagint was authorized during this period. The Ptolemies worked to see that Judaism and Hellenism, Greek influence, Greek culture, could coexist peacefully. Orthodox Jews found that very dangerous for the Jewish faith, the, the, the potential to, to just syncretize them together. The Jewish worship was influenced by this. It became, again, one of the 
One of the ch things that God chided them for in the Old Testament was an external form rather than internal influence. It was during this time that two religious parties emerged. The Hellenizing party, which was pro-Syrian, and the Orthodox Jews, and they had a name. The Orthodox Jews were called the Hasidim. You may have heard that term. A Hasidic Jew, you've heard that? Hasidim means the pious ones. These were the predecessors of the Pharisees. And because of this struggle, we talked about the high priestly struggle earlier, because of this struggle, then Jews began to be divided along political, cultural, and religious lines. And as I said earlier, this is what brought about the attack by Antiochus Epiphanes in 168 to squelch this kind of religious, political upheaval. Israel found themselves caught in the middle of a conflict between the Ptolemy dynasty and the Egyptians who were on the rise. And so then you, you discover the Syrian era gives way. As the Syrians step in and defeat the Egyptians, then they begin to hold sway again. And that's 198 to 165 BC as we said earlier. The Jews came under the control of Syria. Uh, they were treated very harshly, very differently than they had been under Alexander. But they did grant them, the Syrians granted them to have con local control through the high priest. And it's important you see this. If you study with us in the Old Testament, you know the function the high priest had. In the, in the Old Testament, there was prophet, there was priest, there was king. In the intertestamental time, the high priest who leads in the religious expressions takes on more of a kingly role, more of a, more of a governor role, if you please. And a conflict broke out when the, Hel the Hellenizers, the Hellenistic Jews, if you understand, the Jews who have, who have bought into Greek culture, by this time, Jews who have been born into Greek culture and are Jewish only in their bloodline, when they wanted their own high priest who was different from the from the one in the orthodox line and conflict broke out and there was the great uh, rise of Antiochus Epiphanes who sacked Jerusalem in 168 BC trying to destroy his goal was to destroy every distinctive characteristic of the of the Jewish faith he outlawed sacrifice, he outlawed circumcision, he outlawed the Sabbath, and he outlawed the feast days. And in addition, he mutilated and destroyed nearly every copy of the Hebrew Bible. He forced Jews to eat pork to make sacrifices to idols. And he went into the most holy place, you may remember this if you, if you know your, your Jewish history, and he built an altar there and sacrificed to the god Zeus. So God's pushing these people to a desperation. And what this re results in here is a backlash, the Maccabean period, 165 to, 160, uh, 165 to 63 B.C., about 100 years. There was a priest named Mattathias uh, who was uh, one of the Has Hasmonean uh, priests, had five sons, and he lived just northwest of Jerusalem. Syrian officials tried to enforce heathen sacrifice in that village, and Mattathias revolted. He killed a, a Jewish emissary who'd been sent by the Syrians. He killed a Syrian official 
and he fled to the mountains with his family, and thousands of Jews joined him. After Mattathias' death, three of his sons carried on the Maccabean revolt. It was the Maccabean family. Judas Maccabeus, 166 to 160. Jonathan Maccabeus, 160 to 142. Simon Maccabeus, 142 to 134. By 165, think about this now. From what we've described so far, all these, all these groups ruling over the Jews, but they had such success that by 165, they had retaken Jerusalem from the Syrians. They had cleansed the temple. They had restored worship as it was described in the Old Testament. And if you want to know what, is there any, any Jewish celebration that commemorates that event today? It is the Feast of Dedication, which we know as Hanukkah. Hanukkah represents the restoring of the Jewish religion to the, to the holy city, Jerusalem. And it's interesting, we'll see when we get in the Gospels, Jesus himself celebrated the Feast of Dedications as recorded in John 10, 22. The Jews finally received their independence from Syria through as fighting continued in the outlying areas under the leadership of Simon Maccabees in 142 B.C. They saw almost 70 years of independence under the reign of this, of this Hasmonean, this, this high priestly dynasty. And if you read history on this, one of the names you're going to come across is John Hyrcanus, 134 to 104 B.C. Alexander Janius, 102 to 76 B.C. One of the most significant religious developments of this period resulted from the strong difference of opinion concerning the kingship and the high priesthood. For hundreds of years, the position of high priest was held by individuals of political strength rather than those who were descendants of Aaron. Remember, that's how it started in the Old Testament. Orthodox Jews rejected this. And so John Hyrcanus becomes a, uh, a key figure. He becomes governor and high priest. He conquers the area across the Jordan called Transjordan. He conquers Idumea and he destroys the Samaritan temple. He referred to himself as a king, which of course flew in the face of the Orthodox Jews who did not recognize the combining of king and priest. And these Orthodox Jews by this time have a name. They're called Pharisees. And Pharisee literally means separatists. They recognized no king unless he was of the lineage of David. They recognized no priest unless he was of the lineage of Aaron. But there were those who supported the Hasmoneans. They were called Sadducees, from our Hebrew uh, word meaning righteous. And this is when you see these terms focus, uh, surfacing for the same time. So as we head into the New Testament, <coughs> a New Testament. It's helpful to know the backgrounds of this. These folks clash with one another because one has embraced the, the status quo of king and priest being together. Others have stood firm and said, no. If you can't trace your lineage to Aaron, we don't, we don't recognize you as a priest. If you can't trace your lineage to David, we don't recognize you as a priest. Do you see some of the struggle they would have had? in rejecting Jesus. John Hyrcanus, by the way, just he became a Sadducee. But this all came to an end in 63 BC when a Roman general named Pompey conquered Syria and entered Israel. 
There was a fellow named Aristobulus II who claimed to be the king of Israel at this time. Uh, and he locked Pompey out. He refused to let him enter. And so Pompey, in, re in return, in revenge, reduced the size. He took the city by force and reduced the size of Judea. He began to divide up the provinces, which, which still stood in effect, by the way, in the, when Jesus came on the scene. There was a fellow named Antipater, who was an Idumean, who was appointed the procurator of Judea by Julius Caesar in 47 BC. Antipater's son, Herod, eventually became the king of the Jews around 40 BC. It's Herod the Great, by the way, who carried out uh, the building of the new temple in Jerusalem. He was a devoted Hellenist, even though he oversaw the temp temple building. And he hated the Hasmoneans, the the, the high priestly dynasty that had ruled. Herod ultimately killed every descendant of the Hasmoneans, including his own wife, who was the granddaughter of John Hyrcanus, as well as his own two sons, Aristobulus and Alexander. And Herod was the man on the throne when Jesus was born in Bethlehem. The Pharisees, who were, who were operating at this time, uh, believed in the strict adherence to the scriptures. We told you earlier, the, uh, the law, the written law. And they also embraced the Mishnah, the oral law, as long as it flowed from the Torah. The Pharisees had a close connection with the scribes. The Sadducees close connection to the high priest. And because of the Sadducees, as I said earlier, were more of the arist aristocratic type, uh, their emphasis was more on, on social, political, and earthly aspects of working out, of applying Judaism. So what about, what did Rome, we talked about some of the other influences, what did Rome bring to the table? This is fascinating. We, when Rome began to conquer the world, when the Roman Empire began to expand far beyond Rome, it brought with it some things that set in motion the coming of Jesus. I don't know if you've studied this or not, or maybe you did years ago. If you remember something called the Pax Romana, P-A-X Romana, the, the peace of Rome. Rome, by expanding, conquering, they conquered the Germanics, they conquered... Uh, east and west and north and south, they brought with them the Roman garrisons which maintained uh, a peace, the Pax Romana. But they also brought an influence, though, though their language never caught on, they brought an influence called the Lex Romana, the law, L-E-X, the law of Rome, Roman law carried across the known world. With, with Roman law and with Roman garrisons, there was, a, there was a measure of law and order. And Roman law, of course, is what's, what's behind uh, English law and what influenced our country. But they also brought what's called the, the Via or Via Romana, the VIA, the Roman roads. They built a massive network of roads so that they could travel and, and stay in touch, send their garrisons out to police and watch over the conquered territories. And it's been pointed out, rightly so, that with the combination in a, in a world that otherwise would have been full of turmoil and hostility and danger, that the Romans brought a settling which opened the door for the advance of the gospel when the gospel came. You could travel the Roman roads system and not just be charting out into the wilderness in danger of being mugged or murdered by thieves and robbers. 
You could travel the Roman roads under the Roman peace, which was supported by the Roman laws. And so these three things have been observed through history. The, the Pax Romana, the Lex Romana, the, the Via Romana, these things came together, as Paul would say in Galatians, in the fullness of time. In the fullness of time. And only the Romans did this. The Greeks and all of their influence of culture did not accomplish this. The Persians did not. The Egyptians did not. The Syrians did not. And the Jews, even when the Jews had a measure of independence, they fought with one another. It was the Romans who cast a domination over the world that allowed for the gospel to run swiftly when it was introduced into the world. They had a stable government, the Roman Senate, with the Roman Caesars. They built the, the aqueduct system, remember? If you read your, your histories in high school, this incredible way to transport water, and it, and it changed hygiene. Now, not our hygiene. <laughs> None of us would volunteer to live in a Roman village just because they have aqueducts transporting water. But, the, but it had that effect. It, it began to bring civilization. All of the Roman debauchery, all of the Roman persecutions that would come when Christianity began to grow notwithstanding, the Romans brought a level of peace and civility and steadiness and dependability that created a, a climate. Of course, they brought slavery. It's been estimated that in the Roman Empire, five out of every seven people were slaves. Five out of seven slaves. There were no uh, Jews alive that would understand or appreciate the slave culture, but they come from a culture who was in bondage to Egypt before the Exodus. And of course, the, the New Testament culture, those who were brought savingly to Christ in the New Testament in, in these regions were predominantly slaves. The people being brought into an arena where they had no choices, where they had no liberty, the gospel came with a word of liberty. The Romans would defeat a, a, a people and would take them slaves, almost without exception. One of the records I read said that the Emperor Titus of Rome, after his Palestinian campaign, sold 90,000 Jews into bondage. But Roman laws, even though Rome was predominantly slave, passed laws to protect slaves. So we see how the Lord used that. Now, in this Roman culture, this Roman era, the Herodians developed as a people. This was a political party, and their aim was to advance the cause of Herod's government, Herod the vassal king. And they realized that if they could, if they could advance Herod's influence and at the same time recognize the authority of Rome that they could carve out something for themselves and have the protection of Rome and that's what they tried to do. But you'll also won't be surprised by another group popping up called the Zealots. One of Jesus 12 apostles, Simon Zelotes. The Zealots was a political party that was in direct opposition to the Herodians. They saw them as selling out. The zealots refused to conform to Roman rule. And they were active and aggressive. They took up arms as guerrilla warriors. The zealots represented what some called a fiery nationalistic spirit. And then there was another group that emerged. The Essenes, E-S-S-E-N-E-S. -S -E -E -S. The Essenes were a religious sect who withdrew from ordinary society. 
It was a monastic type of life. And they took a very mystical approach to Judaism. Remember now, the Pharisees had a rigid Torah embrace of Judaism. The Sadducees were more of, I don't know if it's fair to call them liberals, but they were definitely more progressive. They, they, they moved among the elite of the Jewish population, and it was more of a political, social approach. The Essenes removed themselves, uh, put out with everything they saw religious, and it becomes a very mystical, experiential approach. They had a passion, one writer said, for the spirit of the law and for being separated unto God. But they did not see anything evangelistic about Israel's mission. They were content to block out the world and ignore its problems and let it die without hope. These are your groups that spring up in the intertestamental period. None of these groups exist as such in the Old Testament. And yet every one of them play a role in the New Testament. And God uses them to advance his cause and to manifest his intentions. I'm going to look at one more thing and then we're going to stop for tonight. The majority of Israelites during this, this period now, we've moved from the time when, when Malachi goes silent to the time approaching the birth of Jesus. The majority of the, of the uh, Israelites lived outside of Palestine during this time. They were found throughout the Mediterranean basin. They were found throughout Mesopotamia, the, uh, the melting pot of civilization, birthplace of civilization. And I told you earlier, because they're outside of Palestine, they developed the synagogue uh, approach to worship. You had to have, I believe it was, it was 10 or 12, the, 10 or 12 male heads of families in communities to establish a synagogue. The majority of Jews did not return to Palestine after the exile. So they, these synagogues began to flourish and began to, to function in the dispersed area. But they also became established in Palestine as people came back from having experienced that in the, in the dispersed area. And this, of course, had to, had to affect the influence of those who were in charge of the temple, the Sadducees. Now, when you talk about this period, you and I refer, I refer to it as the intertestamental period, the 400 years of silence. Catholics, however, and Orthodox Christians, like the Russian Orthodox Church, the uh, Eastern Orthodox, refer to this as the, as this is a big word, but hang, on, hang in here with me, the Deuterocanonical. Remember the book of Deuteronomy? Deuteronomy is simply Deuteros, second, Namos law, the second giving of the law. So the deutero, second, canonical, the, the second uh, expression of, of God's truth. And guess what's going to show up in Catholic Bibles and Eastern Orthodox Bibles as a result of them using this language of the deuterocanonical period? Well, the Apocrypha books written during this period. We're going to look at that next week. Another group of books that doesn't show up in their Bibles, if you've ever seen a, a Catholic version of the Bible, the Douay version, 
D O U A Y, I think is how it's spelled. Do a version. If you go to the back, there's all these books that you don't recognize because they're not in your Bible. It's called the Apocrypha. There's another group of books we're going to look at. We won't take a whole lot of time looking at, called the Pseudopigrapha, the, the false books, the false writings. And these books are sort of a mixture. The, the Apocrypha and the Pseudopigrapha talk about uh, some things historic, some things that they've drawn from the Old Testament. And we're going to see some of that as we, as we move through this. But it's critical to know that that's, where, that's the period in which these things came out. And, and you can read some of that with profit as long as you understand when you're reading it, you're not reading Scripture. Not canonical, not a part of the canon of Scripture, the Old Testament and the New Testament. I think I'm going to stop there. I think that's a good place to stop, and we will, we will pick up next week as we move through some more of this and, and try to give context for what's coming in the New Testament. I almost hesitate to do this, but questions or comments or observations?